Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the IMRST Annual Conference 2022. The UAE branch is fortunate that the IMRS headquarters has reserved the best slot for the best presentation of this conference. We most certainly hope that this discussion with, of course, your active participation proves to be the frosting on the conference cake. If you'd like to ask a question, please go to slido.com and type a hashtag coating. We will pick up the questions during the Q&A session after the presentations. Speaking of uh, frosting, which is typically used to decorate cakes, paints are also used for decorative purposes and for enhancing asset performance, as we will discuss over the next 90 minutes. My name is uh, Nikki Litnani, and I'm the Honorary Secretary of the IMRS UA branch. In fact, today we are joined by a Michelin star coatings industry expert, Mr. Stephen Riley, who's the Global Marine Technical Sales and Support Manager for PPG Protective and Marine Coatings. Steve started this role in April 2021. Prior to this, he held various roles, including Marine Technical Sales and Support Manager for the EMA region for 12 years. Before that, he was involved in a sales role with key account responsibilities for the North of England, having joined PPG in 2002. By the way, PPG is the largest coatings manufacturer in the world. Steve graduated from Newcastle upon Tyne Polytechnic in 1985 with a BSc Honours in Applied Chemistry. He immediately started work in the laboratory developing anti-fouling coatings and later moved into a technical services role and then onto a sales role. For the next 10 years, he undertook various sales, marketing and training roles within the industrial flooring market before returning to the marine industry in 2002. Steve, welcome back to the marine industry. And welcome also to the IMRS uh, Conference 2022. Please enlighten the 658 people who registered for this webinar on how the coating industry contributes towards marine sustainability. Over to thank you, Steve. Th thank you for that understated uh, introduction, Nikhil. I really appreciate it. It's very kind of you. Um, let me just share my screen. Hello, everybody. Uh, and welcome to the, this presentation. Um, as Nikhil indicated, um, active participation is a much appreciated uh, element to this. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to give these presentations, um, but it's actually your presentation, not my presentation. So the more you uh, actively engage, the more you'll get out of it. Without that, we'll move along. In, in short, a brief history of coatings of how we've protected the underwater area of vessels from quite some time ago, from using copper cladding through to uh, starting to introduce um, toxic materials and then into uh, the early 70s when tin-based self-polishing, self-smoothing anti-fouling were originally developed. Um, these came with uh, remarkable uh, benefits and capabilities, but sadly, uh, there was a, uh, a darker side to the tin-based uh, anti-fouling uh, components in that they had a, uh, an effect on the dog whelk and the Pacific oyster in particular. Um, as a result of a great deal of scientific work, uh, these materials were banned and now we are moving into other technical technologies uh, to try to provide that same level of performance. I'm sure you don't need me to point this out, uh, but it needs to be uh, put into context as to 
what the coatings industry is trying to do uh, to alleviate and assist in achieving these uh, demanding targets. Um, EEXI compliance is a major uh, element, but as you know, it's a one-off, whereas CII compliance is going to be an annual challenge where we're constantly asked to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from 2008 levels through various uh, uh, reductions. A very challenging uh, environment that we operate in uh, from a, a, a market perspective. So you, you could compare it to EEXI as the energy rating that you see on modern household uh, goods and CII, just how efficient we are at using fuel. And the direction is to be ever more efficient with the consumption of fuel and therefore the emission of greenhouse gases. May not be a surprise to you with regard to uh, just how much uh, trade is moved by uh, the merchant fleet. It's estimated to be uh, more than 90%. But the fuel consumption is quite a scary number. And this is, of course, annual. And that translates into CO2 emissions. Now, I don't think there's too much of a debate as to the environmental impact CO2 emissions has uh, for us. And the targets on the right of 2030 and 2050 um, are very uh, challenging. 2030 is not that far away when we think about it. Um, in terms of our industry, it's... it's it's around the corner. And we anticipate uh, an environment of increased legislation being brought in and legislation continually coming into force. So that's the impact um, IMO rules and regulations can have on a, a vessel owner and operator. From a coating suppliers perspective we could be considered to be in the chemicals industry and we are not without our own uh, pressures and targets and requirements um, quite understandable when you think about the uh, the chemical cocktails that can be made available uh, these days in 2012, um, the EU introduced the Biocidal Products Regulation. Uh, entry came into force that restricted the number of biocides available to the uh, marine coatings industry. From I, th I think it was about 30 were, were uh, left. The uh, EU decided not to pursue the uh, permit. So now we have 11. And one of those, or I should say more than one, but one predominant one is cuprous oxide. And that was identified by the environmental lobby as being the next biocide uh, target to reduce, to be reduced or to be banned in, in its entirety. Now, I don't want to... Uh, create any uh, scaremongering uh, within the, the audience. Um, but the Environmental Protection Agency in America issued advisory notes to pleasure boat operators, so nothing to do with commercial vessels, but pleasure boat operators, that if they could, in effect, protect the bottom of their boat with anything other than a copper-based material, then they should do so. Now, that's the type of language that started the increased scrutiny on tributyl tin based anti fouling's in the uh, late 80s and early 90s. So it's not without uh, reason to suspect that as we go 
forward, uh, biocides will become more and more difficult to use. There'll be more and more legislation. And ultimately, they may well all be banned. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, we haven't got the crystal ball. Um, but it would be a good thing if we can reduce our uh, dependency on biocides. So how does the coating industry contribute towards this marine sustainability uh, aspect that we're, we're all striving for? Well, from our own personal perspective, um, a silicone coating was developed. Now, it takes some time to develop a coating. Typically, you're looking at a 10-year period from initial concept through to a commercially available product. And in the 90s, uh, the first generation uh, came out with a clear coat. And as you can see, uh, quite regularly, further generations and subsequent generations have come out and the next generation is poised to come out. And this continuous evolutionary process is absolutely critical to keep raising the bar on performance, to keep raising the bar on longevity, sustainability and limiting environmental impact. So it's, it's not without its um, targets that these um, subsequent generations have developed. Uh, these are being designed and developed to meet more and more demanding operational conditions. Now, you may not be uh, totally familiar with this type of technology, but in the uh, schematic on the left-hand side, we see a droplet of water uh, being uh, placed on a surface, a substrate that likes water. So the water droplet spreads out, it wets the surface. The next droplet, it doesn't quite like this surface as much as the first. So the contact angle is changing. It's trying to minimize the point of area of contact of uh, exposure to the substrate. And at the top, we see a droplet of water that does not like the surface at all. Uh, so it tries to ensure it, it has a minimal contact angle possible. And these, this is the basis of these biocide free uh, coatings. They work on the principle of low surface energy low surface free energy to be more precise. And that is a function of adhesion. It's much easier to adhere to a high surface energy surface. How does that scientific description translate into reality onto a coating? Well, here you can see a coating where water has been allowed onto the surface and you can see it's reminiscent of this schematic diagram it's starting to uh, wet the surface, it's opening out its uh, contact angle. Whereas on a, a silicone release system, you can see the water beads very much in line with this schematic diagram here. It tries to minimize its contact point with the surface and substrate. What does this all mean in terms of performance? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with um, these types of graphs where we're looking at whole performance over a period of time. Uh, this is an interesting one in that these are two similar size uh, cruise liners, uh, 11 and 15 years old. And you can see the respective uh, power improvements both vessels experienced having had a fouling release system applied. In fact, what, what's really uh, quite surprising is DNV, who conducted this analysis, was surprised to see a positive effect, a speed improvement benefit over the baseline. They'd never seen that before with conventional coatings technology. Other ways of assessing these is through uh, computational fluid dynamics um, in, in conjunction with uh, force technology in, in Denmark. 
we can see here a standard anti-fouling uh, CFD analysis for different types of vessels, a Newcastle Max and a VLCC, compared to a fouling release coating. And you can see that significant difference in the curves that are achieved with these um, different technologies. So these are substantial differences, um, which equate to a reduction in fuel consumption, which also equate to a reduction into greenhouse gas emissions. CFDs can be done on all sorts of different vessels. We can do them on individual vessels or we can do them on classes of vessel. And here we can see another two classes of vessel operating at higher speeds here, container vessels and LNG vessels. And you can see that significant differential between a standard or a market average anti-fouling and a silicone release coating system. And with the price of fuel it is today, uh, these benefits are significant financially as well as from an environmental perspective. If we look at uh, taking the uh, a sewers max type uh, ship type and looking at the market average anti-fouling, you can see uh, over a five year uh, dry dock period, a colossal 54 tonnes of carbon dioxide emissions can be reduced by simply changing the coating. And with that comes a significant in this particular instance, it's approaching 1,500 tonnes of fuel savings per annum, which again has its environmental uh, attraction, but also has a very, very attractive commercial uh, benefit as well. Another case study um, with this, looking at it from a different perspective, uh, with the same sewers max, looking at the, the return on investment. Um, we understand that these materials cost and they come with a cost uh, that's different to conventional biocide based anti foulings. But with the uh, investment in, in this type of technology, you can see an incredibly quick payback can be, can be realized. We do see very, very strong results in terms of speed power improvements. And individual uh, CFDs can be undertaken, but with the three on the screen, the Newcastle Max, the VLCC and the uh, LNG vessel, you can see substantial power deviations, power benefits, simply by applying a different coating technology. So in summary, how do these, what's the, the benefit, the value of these biocide free coating systems? Well, they can be considered in, in terms of four observable benefits as a power reduction, speed loss performance um, guaranteed, CO2 emission reduction and prolonged protection when the vessel is in static conditions. They also contribute towards achieving EEXI uh, energy efficiency labeling and reducing that uh, category uh, allocation in the CII footprint. So there are multiple levels of benefit that this type of technology can achieve. Excuse me. Now, not everybody is in a position to adopt uh, fouling release coating technology for various reasons. It could be budgetary, it could be operational, it could be something else altogether. But we still try and achieve as good a performance as possible with a conventional uh, anti-fouling. And here we're looking at an ultra low friction copper free material. This is a biocide based coating. So this is not a family release coating, this is a biocide based coating, but it is copper free. And that has a, an, an interesting element 
in its own right, in that a conventional uh, anti-fouling has a significant portion of its formulation represented uh, as a pie chart here, uh, is cuprous oxide. Normally supported with an organic cobiocyte to give it uh, enhanced protection to um, fouling organisms such as slimes and bacteria, bacterial slimes. But there's a lot of it. Whereas by targeting uh, with specific organic biocides, we reduce the biocide content dramatically. So there's a lot less biocide actually being released into the environment and yet still providing outstanding performance. And that comes with other added benefits as well. If we think of cuprous oxide, um, to use your imagination, as a particle, it, it's granular, it's like a, like a fist shape. Um, so if you have a lot of cuprous oxide uh, in, in a film, you can imagine the, uh, the way the uh, particles pack. Um, so you create um, a roughness. By not having a uh, cuprous oxide in there, uh, with particles which are much smoother and flatter, you get a much smoother uh, surface roughness straight away. That's even without the self-polishing, self-smoothing mechanism uh, kicking into place uh, when the vessel goes operational. The other thing is these organic biocides biodegrade very rapidly, very rapidly, whereas with cuprous oxide, Degradation is not so apparent, and we do see bioaccumulation in the sea sediment. So we can see a transition away from cuprous oxide starting to appear. Um, another aspect, I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with the, the very volatile market that we operate in at the moment. Um, everything seems to be going up in price, and... Copper is a commodity uh, product that is attractive for pensions investment funds. Um, it's a very small portion of the overall copper oxide or copper oxide business that, that the marine industry consumes compared to the microelectronics industry and the construction industry. And now we can add to that even more so the uh, automobile industry, an average um, fuel-driven car, petrol or diesel, has an average of about 18 kilos of copper uh, in its construction. Migrating that to an electric vehicle, that increases by 400%. So it's a much higher copper content per vehicle. That means demand for copper is going to go up which means prices will go up. So copper containing anti fouling will become more and more and more expensive as time goes by. Another benefit of the uh, copper free technology is you don't have this change in color. Uh, copper oxide is not only a biocide, but it's also a pigment. So you start off with the rich red brown color and then shortly afterwards, as that copper migrates out of the film, it starts to turn pink. As the copper leaves the, the coating, it, the colour deteriorates. And we don't see that, so we get better cosmetics uh, with this copper-free technology. Copper is also um, highly reactive, which is something that the chemist taps into in terms of performance and protection. But by that same token, it's also its Achilles heel in that it can also continue to react. And I'll show you some examples of how that can manifest itself in a few slides. We're just coming to the uh, profile. On the left, you see a typical conventional cuprous oxide based SPC. 
Now, this is obviously a very, very high powered um, microscope using, using a laser surface uh, measurements. And you can see the very steep peaks and troughs that are associated with that cuprous octile granular particle. But in the graph on the right, you see a much smoother, um, almost uh, flat uh, in comparison uh, surface profile. So that benefit is immediately there once the vessel returns to service without the uh, self-polishing, self-smoothing mechanism even kicking into place. We do like to work with uh, independent third parties. It's becoming more and more important that we um, we utilize their, their independence and their, their measurement techniques. Um, this particular um, example uses a reverse flow tank uh, where they the panel is static and they have um, probes on the on the panel and that move the water across the surface and we were very very happy to be told that this anti-fouling was contributing toward meeting the EEDI requirements, the design efficiency index for these two new buildings. And on that basis, we actually secured two new buildings with this, with this product. Pusan University in Korea, different type of um, measurement, looking at torque as an indicator of resistance, um, an interesting um, way of measuring frictional drag. Uh, measured initially and then over three and six months. And what you see is that deterioration, uh, that drag reduction, which will already be low because of that very, very smooth surface that we saw in the uh, laser spec uh, microscopic uh, photograph, improves further again um, over a six month period by 4%. Uh, TNO, another uh, very well known institute in the Netherlands. Um, a similar appearance, but a, a different way of looking at the performance of the coating. Here, they're looking at the uh, polishing or as they describe it, the erosion rate. And what you have here is uh, test run one and test run two, almost showing perfectly linear delivery over a year and a half measurement period. Now, each individual point that you see on these graph represents thousands of readings, but you can see that they're almost identical. They almost overlap each other perfectly, uh, which is very, very encouraging because that means you get consistent delivery of fresh biocide to the surface in a timely manner. They also undertake a dynamic uh, torque measurement tests using this um, configuration with a looking at the uh, torque required uh, at different uh, speeds and how that translates in terms of across the speed range, what it means in terms of power demand. And again, you can see almost a linearly consistent performance across these. Force technology up in Copenhagen, I mentioned before, looking at their CFD analysis. Now, this is comparing these products to market average anti fouling or standard anti fouling And you can see things like 13% power saving, a reduction in power of 13%. These are substantial figures that can be um, back calculated into monetary value. Now, I mentioned the chemists tap into the very uh, reactive nature of copper, but it's also its Achilles heel. And this is what I mean. A uh, picture on the right showing you how under certain climatic conditions, copper can, can recrystallize on the surface, forming copper salts. This copper patina um, will eventually wash off, but it just shows you the um, nature of the uh, material. And in the picture on the right, where you can see a test patch of uh, copper-free material in the middle, this is only six months in service. And yet this red-brown anti-fouling is already uh, turning quite 
pink, whereas this red brown anti fouling is still red brown and um, handsomely so, it has to be said. Six months performance isn't really anything to be impressed by. Aframax tanker, 60 months in service, 70% operational rate, and a 10 knot average speed. And you can see it's in excellent condition. Uh, the client was so pleased with this. He um, he asked for this to be applied to the, not only back on this vessel, but to another two vessels. Now, this next photograph is, is a challenging photograph in its own right, because it looks like it's being photoshopped, but I can assure you it hasn't. I will challenge you to spot the copper-free test patch that's been applied. And of course, it's here. And this is before high pressure washing. So this is five years in service on a Danish frigate, which was virtually constantly laid up in, in Danish waters. This is a silyl acrylate anti fouling which you would say, well, five years laid up, this is astonishing performance. And yet this is even better again, much better. On the basis of this test patch alone, and the support and evidence we had, this vessel is now being converted into this copper-free technology because of its capabilities. The typical uh, military specification calls for a, a black boot top. Well, a black band, it's hardly a boot top. And here you can see the black band and you can see a band of acorn barnacles stretching the entire length of the vessel but stopping exactly at the join line with the uh, low, ultra low friction copper free formulation. And with that, the presentation is ended. I think we'll go to questions now, I believe. Thank you, Steve, for educating us uh, on the value of anti fouling technologies. My we pleasure. now invite, uh, let me get this right. Yeah, there we are. We now uh, invite Mr. Leroy Dice, an independent coatings uh, consultant and the founder and managing director of Steel Core Dubai to join us as we respond to questions from our audience. Um, welcome on board, uh, Leroy. Thank you, Nikhil. Appreciate the opportunity and excellent presentation, Steve. Very, Thank very you. informative. Thank you. So, gents, uh, let's get on with the first question. And this is from um, Bronco. Yeah. Uh, and, and Bronco asks, what kind of energy savings potential are there when using a high performance anti-fouling as compared with a regular anti-fouling? And uh, much as I would like Leroy to jump in first, but uh, I would ask, this seems more appropriate to, to Steve. So uh, if you allow me, I'll repeat that, Steve. What kind of energy savings potential are there when using a high performance anti-fouling as compared with a regular anti-fouling, Steve? Uh, thank you, Nikhil, and thank you for the question. Um, as you saw uh, towards the end of the presentation, you could see a differential of 13% with a particular uh, type of vessel and, and a mark against a market average anti-fouling or standard anti-fouling with a, an ultra high performance, low friction anti-fouling. So it's individual to each type of chemistry, uh, but that's the type of figure that you can achieve and realize simply by changing the coating. Right, fantastic. And then this is the next one from Bronco, uh, who asks, I struggle to select a suitable anti-fouling when comparing various coating makers and prices. What guidance can you offer me to make a smart choice? I'll let you take that, Steve, as well. That's very kind of you. Um, I'm trying to remain neutral. I'm trying to uh, pick an answer which is practical. I would suggest that you uh, consider your history 
look at the vessels and the performance that you've realized with those vessels and the coatings that have been used on those vessels, that will point you in a particular direction or directions. It may say, uh, this is not for us or this is for us. I have no idea. Um, one of the primary uh, challenges we have in the coatings industry is appreciating most of our customers are not coatings experts. Yep. And there is a degree of scientific information within the formulation in terms of its chemistry, in terms of its biocide content, in terms of its film forming characteristics and how that interacts with seawater that we are desperately trying to get across. We're doing more and more research uh, on how the coatings impacts the performance of the vessel. And the ISO standard 19030 was a great start. It's a nice benchmark to start. Can hardly say it's perfect because it's not, but it's a great benchmark. At least we've created that benchmark in the sand. Now, looking forward, it's a challenging environment we operate in. Cost of fuel um, is one element, one significant element. Dry dock location, dry dock capabilities, um, budget. Do you need, do you have the budget to full blast? Do you need to full blast? One of the ex uh, examples or analogies I always use, and anybody who's been on a conversation, on, on a call, where I've had the pleasure of presenting, please forgive me if this sounds um, repetitive, but if we imagine purchasing a high performance anti fouling as being equivalent to buying a Ferrari or a Lamborghini, if you're that way inclined, you know, either way, an exotic car, but put, put, putting Toyota Corolla tires on there, would you realistically expect to get the same performance out of that? Them with the tyres that would normally be supply? I think the answer is no, and we understand why. So the substrate plays an enormous part and parcel of the ability of a premium coating to deliver. Let's take the scenario of a, a vessel that has, shall we say, a substantial coatings history uh, on, on the bottom that hasn't had the tender love and care it made me, it needed, but it hasn't. Mixed into coat detachment, uh, cracking, uh, maybe even some blisters starting to appear, maybe even some um, crazing appearing on the surface. Will a premium coating adhere to that? Well, after a good high pressure fresh water wash, probably. Most chemistries are compatible these days. Will you as the owner yield the full capabilities that that premium coating is capable of delivering? Absolutely not, because that premium coating is very thin and will follow the contours that it's applied to. So whilst it will stick and it will give you some performance, you will never realize the full capabilities of that coating. Now, a vessel that may be five years old from new building or five years after uh, it, it, it has been fully blasted, generally should be in great condition. Therefore, the requirement would be high pressure fresh water wash as you normally do, spot repair as you normally do. And instead of applying your normal anti-fouling, you apply a, a premium grade anti-fouling. Now, selecting that will be a mixture of commercial and proof of performance and guarantee that will come into play. I hope I've answered that in a, as, as fully and completely as possible, but if, if I've neglected to uh, address a particular point, please let me know. The point that caught my attention was the exotic cars that you spoke about. And when I think of exotic cars, I think about <laughs> Lexus. And when I think about Lexus, then I draw my next question to the owner of the Lex of a Lexus, who's also on our panel. Leroy, 
what, since you're a independent uh, consultant, what are the most common coding failures that you encounter? Most of the failures that we get called to look at are generally in tanks, and that's either in cargo tanks or cargo holes. And those range from either just blistering to full scale detachment, right? So basically detachment of the coating from the substrate. Uh, every so often we also get called to look at hulls that are either not performed as desired or where the coating has sporadically detached from the substrate. And, and this generally is on, on hulls that have not been full blasted at the, at the last dry dock. And I've got to say here that more often than not, uh, what we derive from our findings is that it's not the coating material that's in question, but rather the application of that particular coating uh, that, 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 that is called to question. Uh, and of course, we don't want to cite names or give examples, but it, it, it pretty much um, alludes to the thumb rule that 75 to 80% of all coating failures that are encountered in the industry are directly or indirectly related to surface preparation and application. And, 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 and only a minuscule of them are directly attributed to the actual coating material that is used. Hmm. Can you give us some examples? Like right. I said, uh, First time. You know, because. <laughs> When your next visit to me will be in jail. <laughs> no, I was just pulling your leg. Um, although I, uh, I'd be tempted to ask uh, Steve this, but since, since you've given us a bit of your feedback and shared some of your thoughts, uh, the next question is, uh, what, would you, what would be your advice to ship owners looking to manage their sustainable goals, which is really what this, this whole discussion is about? True. I mean, Steve just... Uh, gave us an indication of what's available in the market, right? There's so many different options available to owners nowadays. So I really urge owners and decision makers to explore what's available in the market because tech is changing at such a rapid pace. There's so much available in the market compared to five years ago or, or even three years ago uh, since your last dry docking occurred. There's so much more available in the market. So I urge you to explore and talk to talk to people in the industry and and derive from other people's experiences if you can uh, you know and, and their results but more importantly i also urge you to not just spray and pray when it comes to your ship uh, but rather have a proper monitoring system in place then again when it comes to monitoring technologies there's so much available out there pick the one that suits you best pick the one that's right for you employ a decent monitoring system that will actually give you something that you can look at. Because if, if you, you cannot measure something that you cannot, if you want to manage something, you've got to be able to measure it. And you cannot measure something unless you monitor it. So I, I, I would strongly encourage owners to not just look at the right technology in terms of coding, but also in terms of monitoring of that, of that asset of theirs. Why does penny wise and pound foolish come to my mind listening to some of your comments? But that aside, a, a, Steve, and the question comes aside from or in addition to anti fouling materials, do you see constant autonomous or robotic hull cleaning while underway happening anytime soon? It's something that is needed. Uh, for certain types of coating, um, you know, we're, we're, we're in, we always seem to be in a transition period and we're, yeah. we're in, we're in another transition period, um, where the, the enactment of the EXI and CII re, uh, requirements are coming into play and not everybody can dry dock all at once and solve those problems. So there will be those towards the end who are playing catch up, um, I know there's been some in interesting developments in ROV technology. Um, so fully automated, no diver in the water uh, seems to be one particular way of addressing uh, safety concerns, particularly in port. 
um, where you know you haven't got somebody in the water at all. You just got uh, ROVs. Um, but I think what's what's fascinating is, and I'm going to come back to the point Leroy made about uh, coatings technology, but also cleaning technology has moved on tremendously. And I suspect it might not be available today, but sometime soon it is going to be available where you'll be able to have something on the hull that keeps your vessel clean. Of course, the flip side of that equation is if you can put a coat on that doesn't need to be cleaned, don't touch it. Prevention is better than cure, isn't it? Always. Yeah, uh, uh, I think, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think this one's once again directed to you because uh, uh, the anonymous person makes reference to the pictures are amazing. Could you give us more details about where the vessels were operating and maybe their names or references to read more about the tests? Of course, I'd uh, leave it to your discretion to uh, answer the latter part of the question, but uh, the pictures are amazing. Could you give us more details about where the vessels were operating? Um, I'd Just... prefer to have that conversation with you directly or via uh, uh, an account manager. Um, please forgive me. Th th this audience is unknown to me. I, I don't know who's out there. And some of that data is going to be sensitive, commercially sensitive, and I think we have to respect everybody's business ethics here. Um, certainly happy to have that conversation with you on a one-to-one -one basis. Fantastic. Let's err on the side of caution here. Well said, Steve. Um, Tin-based anti-foulings have been phased out due to the harmful effects on marine organisms. Do you foresee IMO rules regarding anti-fouling Anti-foulings becoming more stringent. I think you made reference to that, uh, Steve. Oh, most, most definitely, most definitely. Um, I, the I don't have the crystal ball that tells me when when the biocides will be banned. Um, I wish I did, but that's hmm. another story. Um, the EU position. I think we could probably say they are the lead in this area. And the EU structure has introduced the Biocidal Products Directive, which was aimed at the manufacturers of biocides, so not people like us. That was cleared. And then we went into Biocidal Products Registration, which is aimed at users of biocides, that is the paint industry. And as I say, the, there is a, a significant reduction uh, in this. Now, the Biocidal Products Directive, the original uh, filtration process, was a good game of poker. You know, this, this is high stakes poker of significant. You know, it was $5 million to get your, anti your, your biocide registered and approved. Um, and there's always a possibility at the end of the day, someone says, Sorry, my boy, you don't cut the mustard, your biocide is banned. So it had its effect, its desired effect, if you like, in that 30, about 30 biocides were withdrawn from the market. But the biocidal products registration, this is the bit where the coatings manufacturers, all the coatings manufacturers of anti fouling uh, is concerned, that's time limited and is under constant review. Now, the vehicles are in place from the original tin ban for EU member states and any other country to start making their own decisions to ban biocides. That's already there now. Those, those vehicles are there. So this will be, could be quick. I don't think it will be quick, but it could be. But the focus is certainly right for smack bang on biocides for that sustainability element that these materials are being released into the environment. We have to start minimizing what we release so that it either has got good biodegrading characteristics or is harmful, har sorry, harmless, Freudian mistake, harmless. Um, 
but that's going to limit the technologies that are here today. And that is going to create the mushroom of innovation of approaching this from completely different perspectives, looking at um, exotic chemistry uh, that's hitherto never been considered. That's where this will come in. Um, there's an awful large research and development effort, certainly within my own company, to, to look into that in, in, in its different guises. Because as I mentioned, it takes about 10 years to take an idea and turn it into something that's available to buy. Um, this isn't a quick, um, oh, I've had the idea, let's sell it tomorrow. There's a, a, an awful lot behind this. And of course, uh, our own companies, uh, environmental, environmental sustainability and global governance uh, compliance comes into play as well as the external community. So it's very high on the agenda for us. Any comments from you, Leroy? Well, no, I think Steve's pretty much uh, said it all uh, because I, I'm not completely aware of the latest rules and regulations at what IMO does. So, but I, I think Steve's the authority there in that respect because you, you've got active participants there within the industry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, with the advent of ultrasound hull protection systems, will mm -hmm. that lead to the phase out of anti fouling, sir, Steve? No. No. Um, it could well be uh, used in conjunction. Um, I, I, let, let, me, let me backtrack. Let me reverse. Let's not call them anti-foulings because there's other properties or other types of products like fouling or lease coatings aren't anti-foulings. They are biocide free. So ultrasound has its place potentially in niche areas. I don't think the practicalities, the way it's currently configured, mean it can be applied to the general uh, large area of a vessel. Um, but in niche areas, it, it could well be an extremely useful uh, supplement to the um, overall protection plan for a vessel. So maybe a sea chest or you know an, an, in, an inlet uh, where you've got potentially s slow movement of, of water or, or even stagnant water as it, as it can become. Um, may, maybe there, there, there is benefits. Um, but at, at the, the way they're currently set up, um, not yet. They would, they need to be, make significant uh, improvements before they'll, they'll they'll take over. Yeah, I think I, I, I concur with Steve's statement there because I think they, they need to be in close proximity to those sensors that they put out there because it, it, it it's basically a sensor based uh, approach wherein. They use a sensor to to kind of disallow uh, any fouling happening on the hull. So they are limited in terms of how much area they can actually cover and how far away they can move away from the from the base. So yeah, the sea chest etc. is ideal because uh, yeah, I think and Steve's right. It's a great combination to have that in, 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 in along with the traditional anti fouling. Yes. Yeah, but I presume there's a limitation to the number of bells and whistles you can have on board, isn't it? Absolutely. True. Yeah. I'll, I'll open this up to the both of you. The next question, is there any biologically active material being tested, i.e. incorporating microscopic low drag and no growth fouling organisms, which don't prevent any other fouling to attack the surface? Uh, I, I would have thought, Steve, you covered this in your um, uh, copper free, but uh, is there something else that you might want to add for this specific question? Is there any other, is there any biologically active material being tested, i.e. incorporating microscopic low drag, or microscopic, we saw that fantastic slide of yours, microscopic low drag and no growth fouling organisms, which in turn prevent any other fouling to attack the surface? There are various lines of investigation 
in the R and D laboratories at the moment, um, and that that is one of them. Um, we're looking at a whole range of of different uh, approaches to how to protect uh, long term, how to, how to protect these uh, valuable assets. Um, so of course, we can we can come up with something that is very very um, functional from a, a, a protection perspective, but that's very easy to damage or it's in, too expensive to apply at this point. So there are uh, some naturally occurring materials that uh, uh, are useful um, to, to, to supplement um, other technologies. Um, the focus now is to move away from the core biocytes, if you like, um, from our own perspective, that's the direction we need to move in, we believe, to look to the future of um, the planet in terms of uh, what we're doing to seawater. Right. Yeah. I have a question which has come before we... Uh, thanks, Steve. Uh, and this one's probably for you, uh, Leroy, or at least uh, also, I believe. What would be your response to someone who says coatings are bad for the environment due to the VOC generated? Okay. Um, All the organic compounds. <laughs> my, my loyalties clearly lie with the paint industry, having worked for a paint manufacturer myself and for a paint contractor pretty much all of my life. Uh, I think it's pretty clear where my loyalties lie. That's uh, what got you the likes, isn't it? <laughs> but I, I think VOC is the necessary evil in this whole process. And I think the best way to answer this question is, is to consider what would happen if you don't apply coatings. And there, there's a documented fact of, in order to protect one ton of steel over a five year period, it costs you between 200 and $500, right? To protect that one ton of steel. Now, if you leave that one ton of steel unprotected over a five year period, in, in a harsh marine environment, you will have to replace that ton of steel. It will cost you between three and $10,000 to replace that one ton of steel, depending on where that steel is on your asset. So now you just gotta think about the commercial and the environmental impact that you're gonna have replacing the ton of steel versus protecting it with coatings. Now, if that's not enough, you just gotta look at your fuel bill of dragging a heavily fouled ship across the ocean if you, if you leave it uncoated. So you're right, you know, Bon Jovi song comes to mind is you give love a bad name. I mean, you know, the, the, the paint industry has given itself a bad name, but you've got to look at what would happen if, if there weren't any paint or coatings that were there to protect the seals. What would happen then? I think impact, the environmental impact, the, the carbon footprint would be much, much higher. Uh, again, it's down to the VOCs, and I think there's a lot of effort being made uh, with my paint companies to reduce VOCs. And you know, I, I, I think Steve can maybe uh, pick me up while I stumble here and, and talk a little more and tell tell us what you're doing in terms of VOC compliances. You know, absolutely, Leroy, and, and thank you. Uh, it's it's a very um, it's a very unusual question. I'm glad someone's raised it because it's it's something that's dear to my heart. Um, I know from my own company's perspective, our objective hasn't been reached because we're trying to constantly reduce uh, VOC emissions. Um, it is a challenge. Um, we can look at it from a solvent-free technology, and there are some really top quality solvent-free coatings that are out there but they're more expensive. Um, we can look at waterborne coating technology, but they're not all suitable for the, in, the diverse environmental conditions that we've got on a ship, internal or external. So again, I'm going to come back and say we're in that transition period where we're, we're trying to swing that needle. There are certain types of technology where you cannot go solvent free. You physically cannot go solvent free. A great example would be a shop primer. So this is new steel construction, 
going through the steel mill being blasted and painted. That coating has to dry within two minutes. Okay, we can make coatings dry quickly, but it also has to have zero effects when being cut and when being welded. Now you can't do that with thick carbon-based coatings. That's just physically impossible. So the technology has been zinc silicate, uh, inorganic zinc silicate. But you can't make them thick and you can't make them solvent free. We're moving towards waterborne technology, but particularly in, in, in the region where you, you, you guys are in Dubai, water is an expensive material uh, on, on large uh, volumes. So and it evaporates very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the practical comment, Leroy. Um, <laughs> the, you know, so, so this is a, an ever-changing uh, game that, needs, that we, we need to navigate our way through to get to the point where we've either got ultra high solid solvent free materials or waterborne technologies. Now, the paint industry is part of the material science industry. You know, we sort of sit on the side of that. Okay. Now, when I started in the laboratory in 1985, if you'd have said the words water and epoxy in the same sentence, you, that was almost heretical. If you'd have mentioned the word water and polyurethane in the same sentence, you'd have been thrown out because you don't know what you're talking about. Now these products are regularly available and they've got some really good characteristics. So let's not focus on what's behind us, but the future is starting to recognize that we need to reduce what's going into seawater and reduce what's going into the atmosphere as much as possible. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Leroy and Steve. Yeah. We have our last question on Slido from Arvind Ahuja. And Arvind asks, I think this was more or less answered, but he's more or less looking for a concurrence. Will the use of low friction biocide paint also save the ship owners money on having to perform underwater hull cleaning? Uh, yes, all things being equal. If the vessel uh, is suddenly subjected to a very prolonged uh, period of idle uh, for, for whatever reason, uh, this idle period can have a detrimental effect and it may need to be cleaned as a result of that. I can't say any more than that because different companies have different technologies and different idle times. But in theory, you might be okay in practice, you might need to do it. I don't know. Each case needs to be considered on its own merits. You know, recently I was uh, in a discussion on aluminum content of uh, in paints. Okay. Yeah. How how critical is that, and how much influence does it play in terms of performance? <laughs> Let's look at them both. Let's look at the inside and the outside. Yeah. So when okay. I say inside, I'm looking at uh, the PSPC requirement of a 15-year-old paint yeah. and uh, the hull yeah. coatings as well. Okay. Um, it, it's it's a, an interesting industry discussion. Um, let, let's look at it from this perspective. Um, why does it need to be in there? So it, it provides some protection. It, gives some performance. So if we develop a coating that doesn't need aluminium, does that mean it doesn't work? Yeah. No, of course it works. It works by a different mechanism. Okay, so does that mean we should move away from aluminium? Well, aluminium has some benefits and some drawbacks. One of the drawbacks of aluminium is the way it comes to us in the industry is as a paste. You know, we, we, we don't have aluminium particles, we have aluminium paste. And that has its own um, solvent content. 
So whenever we start putting aluminium into a, a coating, then that actually contributes to the VOC content. So to have a solvent-free containing aluminium is a complete contradiction because the way the aluminium is used has solvent. So you've not, by definition, gone solvent-free. So does it, have, does it have some characteristics? Yes. Is it the only game in town? Absolutely not. No. No, it's not. Um, and, and there's been a, you know, um, a manufacturer who's done a very uh, good job on uh, positioning uh, an aluminium content from a, a marketing perspective. But that aluminium content is specific, actually, to their formulation mm. and their formulation construction. It doesn't translate into anybody else's product because they're two different products. I mean... Um, Okay, Nikhil, what's your car? Audi. So which one's better, an Audi or a Lexus? Uh, Nikhil, an answer. Please answer. Uh, it's down to opinion. It's down to all sorts of different But there's both internal combustion engines with four wheels, seats, doors. But they're two different cars. So why, 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 why does Audi need to introduce Lexus technology and vice versa? If you've got your technology, you've got your technology. And it works. And it works. You could turn around and, and say, um, okay, um, rather flippant uh, answer uh, to this. Uh, I, I can give you a, a coating with a lot of aluminium in, um, but um, everybody on the ship should have blonde hair. <laughs> Why? I just feel like it. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Yeah, the conversation I make reference to had that kind of logic. And speaking about setting benchmarks here, um, and forgive my naivety in this aspect, for the, yeah, well, let's take a step back and see. Can you explain to us uh, the difference between a fouling release coating, as you made reference to, and an anti-fouling coating? Because very often in the industry, everybody, it's it's the blanket anti-fouling, uh, the term anti-fouling, which is used. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, it's a very good point, and it, it does need to be cleared up. Um, anti-foulings are registered products. They are approved by class uh, to comply with uh, the legislation and this at the moment is it's tin free um, and now we have this cybutrin um, requirement we've not used cybutrin for a very very long time um, so anti-foulings are based on a biocide or biocides um, protect the vessel by a process where the Biocide dissolves, migrates to the seawater ship interface. Um, our, foul, our organisms come along, don't like that environment, and swim away. But that biocide will then sort of dissipate into the wider volume of seawater the vessel is in. So you need a fresh stream of biocide to come through. Now, that can only come through up to a point if the resin component breaks down fast enough. You have what's called a leached layer. So side of the ship, nice anti-fouling coating. Water penetrates the coating. Remember, these coatings are designed to break down. So water penetrates the coating and starts the hydrolysis process. The biocide migrates to the surface, protects the hull, and then dissipates. Now, if you allow that to continue without this resin layer being removed, no matter how much biocide you've got back here in the deep part of the film, it can't get out fast enough. So our organism comes along and says, oh, great, I like that. And once they're colonized, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so it's the protection mechanism using a biocide-based coating is twofold. You've got the dissolution of the biocides and you've got the hydrolysis um, and chemical breakdown of the resin to reveal fresh biocides. And that two twin track uh, chemical reaction process continues until the anti-fouling is consumed. Fouling release coatings don't provide any biocides to the surface. There is nothing to dissolve. In fact, water doesn't like it. So it tries to 
keep away from it. So provided it doesn't get me mechanically damaged, it carries on protecting the vessel. And when you come to an anti-fouling specification, if you turn around and say, oh, well, you know, uh, I want to spec for two years, three years, five years, you see anti-fouling thicknesses change to cater for that increase in time. Mm. With a foul release coating system, if you want it for 12 months or 120 months, it's exactly the same specification. There isn't any change. And DFT, the dry film thickness of the functional top coat, is king because that's where the release properties are housed. That's the functional top coat. But it functions by being completely inert and having a low surface energy. So, sorry for bringing in a little bit of chemistry on that. Yeah, no, no, thank you. Um, is it fair to say that <clears throat> now, since you've provided us some clarity on fouling release systems, i.e., uh, you know, loosely called silicon systems, is it fair to say all silicon systems are made alike? In a very loose sense, yes. Uh, um, the way they go about delivering their performance, no. Um, because some rely on a biocide to provide performance. And if you think about um, a silicon matrix, and I've shown you the, the way the water resists interaction, let's see, with, with the silicone. But then you've got a water-soluble biocide in the coating. You have to do some chemical trickery to get water into the coating to get the biocide out. So you get a difference in performance between the two systems, even though they're loosely de defined as silicone coatings. Correct. Yeah. All right. Leroy, any concluding remarks? Uh, <clears throat> yes, I think in, in general, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you. And I, I learned a lot today. So thank you, Steve. But I think in general, in my opinion, I think there's, there's a lot of investment in technology in terms of development of coatings, in terms of developing their, their anti-corrosion and, and, and the anti-fouling of all the release properties of materials, right? But I think the, the next available opportunity for us is, is, is in the development of the application because if you look at a typical dry docking that happens uh, generally, you're still applying five coats of paint on the hull of a ship, right? Again, and we, we know VOCs is, is the necessary evil in the system, but on the flip side, you are applying five coats of paint. So in my opinion, I think the next opportunity for us in terms of you know optimization is, is going to be that, is going to be Either you cut down on the number of coats in what you apply, which in turn will obviously cut down the, the time that the vessel spends in the dry dock, optimize the whole value chain process, or then find a better way of, of, of putting the paint on, you know, rather than spray it, you know, find a better way of putting the paint on. So uh, I'm pretty sure uh, there is technology development and progress for that, but that is going to be the next available big opportunity for us in this industry. I don't know if Steve wants to comment on this part in any shape or form. Well, thank you. You're, you're right. Um, I, th I think it's a multifaceted approach. We've got to look at surface preparation, uh, improvements there, uh, using different and innovative technologies, application, using different and innovative technologies, and the products themselves bringing these three elements together we can move mountains uh, as an industry and uh, that, 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 that's not sort of over egging the pudding um, we can make dramatic changes to what we used to do compared to what we will do agree thank you uh both uh, Leroy and Steve. I think it was uh, evident from uh, Steve's presentation that innovative coatings, uh, both the silicon-based uh, and copper-free, could be unique solutions for 
meeting the EEXI and CII ratings. The time is now and the countdown is on. So for those of you operating ships, you need to develop a time-bound action plan as part of your decarbonization strategy. If we are to believe that an appropriate coating has the potential to reduce engine power consumption by up to 20%, then it might be worthwhile to consider this energy efficient technology, not only to comply with regulations, but also to have a favorable return on investment and not look at savings in isolation. Uh, folks, uh, let's not ignore the elephant in the room. It's all about the Benjamins. Ladies and gentlemen, we hope that you have found some insights on how the coating industry contributes towards uh, marine sustainability. Thank you for joining us and particular appreciation to those who've contributed questions in this lively interaction. Please feel free to contact uh, any of us for any further information. Until then, friction-free greetings from Dubai and the UK. All well said. Thank you. Thanks,